Namaste. So let's continue with the introduction to Shiva's thousand names with a description of the history of how it came down from Brahma to the present day. Idang Brahma Pura Kritva Sarva Loka Pitamaha Sarvastavanang Divyanang Rajatve Samakalpayat Brahma, the grandsire of all the universe, having in the days of old composed it, assigned it to the foremost place among all excellent hymns. So the Shiva Sahasranam is not an ordinary hymn. It's not even an ordinary Vedic hymn, but it is the supreme among all hymns, and especially the Vedic hymns. And that's because the object of this hymn, Shiva, is the supreme among all gods, Deva Deva. He's the god of the gods. So even the demigods who are extremely powerful and intelligent in charge of various aspects of the material nature have to go to Shiva when something goes wrong. Even Brahma and Vishnu, when they couldn't solve their problems by themselves, went to Shiva and begged for help. And that's who we are in this world. We're all beggars. Uh, we might not to like to think of ourselves like that. The ego wants to think, I'm powerful, I'm resourceful, I am the cause of all kinds of things. <laughs> it's actually just illusion. Everything is happening by the will and energy of God. God and Goddess, Shiva and Shakti, are actually united, but they apparently separate in order to create duality, the illusion, the material existence. So this is the first triple, Shiva, Shakti, and their relationship their dealings with each other, their activities in creating the universe, and so on. And, of course, we're going to learn all about this in Shiva Purana. But the basis of our devotion to them is in chanting their holy names. And we already went through the Lalita Sahasranama, or at least as far as we could get, <laughs> Now we're going to look at the Shiva Sahasranama in detail. Tada prabhriti chayva syangi shwarasya mahatmanaha stavarajeti vikyato jagatya mara pujitaha brahma loka dayang chayva stavarajo vataritaha From that time, this hymn to the greatness and glory of the high-souled Mahadev, which is held in the highest esteem by all the deities, has come to be regarded as the king of all hymns. Yasmatthaniti pura praha tena tandikrito bhavat svarga chaivatrabhulokang tandina yavataritaha this king of all hymns was first conveyed from the region of Brahma to heaven, the region of the celestials. Tandi then obtained it from heaven. Hence, it is known as the hymn composed by Tandi. Sarva mangala mangalyam, sarva papa pranashanam, negadishye mahabaho, stavanamutamang stavam. From heaven, Tandi brought it down to earth. It is the most auspicious of all auspicious things and is capable of cleansing the heart from all sins, however heinous. So this king of all hymns has come down to us from ancient, ancient times, way before even Brahma created the Prajapatis. Because Brahma and Shiva had this relationship from the beginning of the universe when he empowered Brahma to create. So this is the natural 
expression of Brahma's devotion to Shiva. And Brahma, being extremely intelligent, he was able to easily put together 10,000 names of Shiva based on his qualities and pastimes. So then, that hymn, the king, the basics of all real hymns, came down to heaven, to the heavenly planets, to the demigods. And the sage Tandi picked it up there and brought it down to earth. So it's known as the Tandiya Stutra, but it's not really by Tandi. Tandi just brought it, conveyed it down to earth. In fact, the word avatara is used here. Hyavataritaha. That he brought it down. Avatara means to descend. It came down from heaven. It is not a product of human intelligence. Very important. The only human intelligence involved is in churning it to extract the cream or the butter, huh? the essence of these 10,000 names in the thousand names that we are going to study in this series. Now, the specific property of this hymn is that it is the most auspicious of all auspicious things. Huh? Where is that? Sarva Mangala Mangalyam. Of all auspicious things, it is the most auspicious because it cleanses all sins from the heart and mind of the hearer. And this is very important because we all have a backlog of sinful reactions, karma. That's why we're here. We wouldn't be in this crazy world if it wasn't for the fact that we did some crazy things in the past. So, all right. What's done is done. But then the question is, how do we become cleansed from those reactions? How do we bring ourselves into a higher state of being? How do we get uh, beyond this earth, beyond this material body, these defective senses in mind, these highly limited, gross material things, and reach a higher state of being? In other words, how do we approach the higher planets? How do we take a birth in a body which is suitable for the higher realms? Well, first of all, the material body is temporary and it's bound to fall off <laughs> in due course of time. So the best thing we can do then is get ready for life without the material body in mind. And how do we do that? by dreams, by cultivating dreams, svapna consciousness. And this is the role of bhakti yoga. In bhakti yoga, we use various metaphors to approach a state of being where the gross material body, the anamaya kosha, or food body, is no longer necessary to us. That means we have to shed all the desires that require gross material things, gross material senses, qualities, objects, and so on, including the material body, and cultivate a type of existence that is dependent only on the higher bodies, the pranamaya kosha, energy body, the manomaya kosha, the mind body, the vijnanamaya kosha, the intelligence or will or causal body, and the ananda maya kosha, which is pure bliss, pure consciousness. Uh, so these four bodies are capable of existing quite independently from the gross body. In fact, the gross body is a manifestation, an outgrowth of these more subtle bodies. And we've gone over all this independent arising Paticca Samupada, as taught by the Buddha, he gives a very good subjective account of how the creation proceeds and how we fashion a gross body from simply thoughts, sankara, and so on. But the whole thing is based on ignorance. The whole thing is based on not knowing 
that our real self is not this material body. This material body is just a tool. You know, it's a chess piece on the board of the world. It's uh, very easily manipulated. And we all are manipulated by governments and media, politics, you know, disinformation. And this is only going to get worse. It's better, if you can, not to read the news. <laughs> you know, just stay filled up with Shiva Katal, topics of discussion about Shiva, about Shiva, his names, forms, activities, pastimes, qualities, associates, his world, and so on. All topics related to Shiva are transcendental because the referent, the thing that gives these topics their meanings, that gives these names their meanings, is Shiva, and Shiva is transcendental. He doesn't fit inside the material world. <laughs> He's beyond it. He's too big. He's too powerful. I mean, the material world is, is like his hobby, you know? Yeah, you could call it a simulation, but it's not really a simulation of anything except itself. And Shiva and Shakti's wild imagination... <laughs> And they can get really far out. So this world is absolutely unreal. Why is that? Because it only exists temporarily. And when this world is finished, it disappears. And if we have invested our attachments, our affections, our identifications, our identities in this material energy, they will all be vanquished. So it's better to detach from all of that. It's better to withdraw from the material energy. It's better to drop all material affairs as much as possible and simply let all that stuff grind to a halt because of not giving it energy. Don't give energy to the government. Don't give energy to the news. You know, don't give energy to stories of disinformation, propaganda that you might encounter online. Don't give energy to social media. You know, all of these interactions are just software. You don't know which of them are bots, especially now with conversational AI. So it's best to just drop all this. If you know some people who are also on the spiritual path, it may be useful, it may be encouraging to associate with them. And certainly with internet now, it's possible to associate with people anywhere. So if you know some people like that, it's good to stay in touch with them. Otherwise, it's better to be a hermit. You know, it's better to be detached from society because society is only going to try to fill you up with its tasks, its priorities, its agenda, and so on, and use you. It's going to become a context that uses you. So we went over that in one of our early series. But a context that uses you is basically something that takes over your life, gives you an identity, gives you a task, and then rewards you for doing that task or not. <laughs> Mostly we get cheated if we take up the work of the material world. Because the world is temporary, everything in it is temporary, including these different types of work and identity and the rewards derived therefrom. So it's best to just let it go because we're going to have to let it go anyway. It's inevitable. This material body will fail. It will get old, dwindle, and disappear and there's nothing we can do about that. That's inevitable. Huh? Death and taxes. <laughs> so if we uh, even pay our taxes, we're still going to die. So the, the main thing that we have to do in this life is to worship Shiva so that we concentrate our energy, time, and attention on the things that really matter because they're eternal. Aung Tat Sat.
ओम शांति ही ओम ओम नमः शिवाय